Today we are once again time traveling to look at some of the earliest pieces that I wrote and as promised today we're going to look at my first attempt at writing for orchestra which was my symphony number no. one. No, not the one that I've been putting videos out on for several weeks now, but a symphony number no. one from December of 2014 when I was 15 years old. I have no idea why I decided to call this piece a symphony. I didn't really know any symphonies at the time, at least not that I cared much for. Like I knew Beethoven 5 and Mozart 40 and you know, the ones that people know, but not any that I really cared for. I guess I just thought like, hey, I'm a composer and composers write symphonies. So I gotta start writing symphonies. And in fact, I wrote a lot of pieces that I called symphonies. The highest in numbers I got without resetting was symphony number no. five. And well, today, several years later, I am actively working on my symphony number no. three. So you can probably get an idea of how spectacular those pieces are. But I am not just gonna be roasting it. I will try and be fair to the piece and also identify reasons that my writing may have been the way that it was. So without further ado, let's listen to my symphony number no. one from December of 2014, composed in the LaGuardia airport. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, it's got a strong opening. I want to compliment that, but I just noticed this, this floating forte piano in the, in the bass clarinet and I'm, I'm expecting more stuff like that to crop up. I don't think I actually wanted a forte piano there. I have, there's not even any other forte piano around here. I, who knows? Who knows? All right, let's start over. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's got a good opening. I, I like the opening a lot. It's got a good rhythmic drive in the foreground. I mean, the trumpets are just like, I have them marked at Fortissimo. We're gonna notice a lot of dynamic problems. I, I already know that. So yeah, the trumpets are kind of blasting, but you know, I do, I, I think this is the the foreground is in the is in the brass. Um, and so there's a good rhythmic drive there. And then there's also a good rhythmic drive. We got some offbeats in the in the upper strings. So yeah, okay, let's, let's listen to the next phrase. Finally get past bar eight. Yeah, there's a good, like, rhythmic snappiness to it. Okay. Heard this before. Doing it again. Okay, because of the way that finale is, I can't really see the strings as they're happening, unfortunately. But yeah, this is what's going on. A lot of staccato quarter notes, some fortissimo offbeat pizzicato in the in the low strings, some some chords. Uh, let's let's go. Let's back up. A lot of four bar phrases. It's okay. <laughs> That's the big chord, <laughs> the big quadruple stop thing. That's pretty cool. It's a development of that idea. That that's a that's an idea that gets developed. I don't know why it's not really quite playing it as I would like. That's a really cool cadence that's ruined by unequal dynamics. Let's listen to that again. <laughs> the low strings are just blasting away stop okay what do we got here yeah ba -da 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 -da. so it's like a c minor tried and then the, the low strings a b flat into the c it's cool that's pretty neat and then it just takes off again i'm hmm. i'd be surprised if this is not an exact repeat that's what i'll say <laughs> maybe it, maybe it, there's some different stuff i don't know the floating forte piano is gone from the bass clarinet part <laughs> looks mainly the same. It might be a little thicker. Yeah, the orchestration might be different, but it's, it's the same, it's the same music. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, we don't need to listen to all that. I'm gonna skim it and see if anything different happens. It ends on that same type of cadence, the, the triad, C minor triad thing, and then B flat to C in the low strings, which, yeah, I mean, it's like, it, yeah, it's just the same sort of chunk of music and it happens twice. I think it's fast enough and short enough that it gets away with it. I think this has a really strong character, but yeah, there, there's not so much in the way of development of ideas. And God, the dynamics, I swear to God, they are just like, the dynamics are terrible and all over the place. I generally, just to like sort of put this out there, I guess, in terms of what my philosophy with dynamics is, is I try not to typically have more than two simultaneous different dynamic markings. And here there, it's just like, I mean, marking brass at, at uh, triple forte, constantly double forte triple forte and there's no crescendo there's no subito so it's like it's it's really ambiguous like what the players are are meant to do like we have mezzo pianos here and then and triple f in the in the low strings and then the violins go to forte but there's no crescendo there's no subito nobody knows what to do why are the violins fortissimo here and the low strings are mezzo forte another philosophy i have with dynamics don't overdo the the triple f's and the triple p's and if you do, then don't overdo the quadruple S and the quadruple P's. Because the more the more you expand your like dynamic spectrum, the less meaningful the differences between each dynamic marking is, if that makes sense. If you're consistently operating on the scale of like quadruple P to quadruple F, the difference between mezzo piano and mezzo forte is greatly reduced as opposed to operating on the spectrum of piano to forte or piano pianissimo to, to fortissimo. Now, I like my quadruple F sometimes. I try not to, I, I think in my actual symphony number one, I have a quadruple F moment, but I think it's only at the very end. I do have a couple of triple F moments, but it's a four movement thing. So I was like, you know, use your, use your triple Fs once per movement and then your quadruple Fs once per piece. That's what my, that's what I'll say my philosophy is right now. I can come out with a whole video on that. I have <laughs> so many opinions on it. Anyway, like I said, it's the same chunk of music that happens twice for that, for that first movement, but something that I'm sure the composers watching have noticed, particularly the particularly the orchestral composers, is the wind writing. So if we go back to the beginning here and we just look at like the list of instruments, we have flute, oboe, clarinet and B-flat one, clarinet and B-flat two, bass clarinet, bassoon, contra bassoon, horn and F1, horn and F2, trumpet and B-flat one, trumpet and B-flat two, trombone and tuba. Um, this might seem inconspicuous to folks who don't write for orchestra, but I thought writing for winds in an orchestra was like writing for winds in a band where you just write the part and you don't know how many people are necessarily going to be on it. That is not the case in the orchestra. With the orchestra, it's one to a part unless you specify otherwise. So for example, if, if I actually gave this to an orchestra, there would only be one person playing each of these parts. And that's to say nothing of the fact that this is like a really, really weird instrumentation to have for a symphony. So normally you'd have two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, uh, two bassoons, and then maybe some auxiliaries like the bass clarinet and the, the contra bassoon. But it, it's so weird to have just one flute, but then also have a contra bassoon. It's just one of those things that I had to, that I had to learn at some point. Trumpets in B flat should be in C in orchestras, at least in the United States. And there should also be four horns. I'm, I'm less mad about that, but I, I will critique it equally because I, I know that I didn't uh, know what I was doing. Plus three trombones is typical. That's the normal, the normal amount. Speaking of the brass, the trumpets are scored really, really high. Let's go back to the beginning here. Just listen to the trumpets. Like pushing them up to the top of the register just immediately out of the gate, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do. Likewise, a lot of relatively low flute stuff, like all this stuff that is within the, uh, the staff, it's just not gonna get heard. No matter how many 
fortes I give them in the dynamic marking. Now that's not, I'm not saying that as a, as a general rule that flute in the staff won't be heard. I'm saying that because there's also like just brass blasting through this whole, through this whole section. That's, that's why I'm saying that. It's not that you can't write for flute in the, uh, in the staff. Again, I just adore this, this floating forte piano. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. I didn't spot any other like unintentional floating dynamics, so, so that's at least good. But you can see the dynamics are like colliding with bar lines and stuff, and, and I'm not going to blame myself too much on that one. I, th I think I can blame it on uh, Finale. <laughs> Lesel's in a, uh, some of the second movement. Listen to the end of the first movement again just to... Just to remind ourselves of where we came from. Way too loud low strings. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out here so you can actually see this. Except that sucks. Okay, well the score doesn't matter so much, but this is what's happening. There's a the pizzicato and the cellos and then uh yeah. There's a nice sparseness to it. And it's like, really, the pacing is stretched. Like, it's, it's very different from the first movement, which I think is a good thing. I don't like that we're still in C minor, and also the texture, the whole texture just changed way too fast. Like, we could have had that pizzicato thing sort of continue, you know what I mean? Oh my lord. Okay, I'm adding a- this is unlistenable, hang on. Mezzo forte. Thank you, Lord. All right. That works. It's a cool idea, but it sure has happened three times now. D minor chord. C minor. And the intro thing has started again. A different melodic idea. Yeah, there's like not enough space between ideas. Like it doesn't. It's slow. It doesn't give itself room to breathe, though. Especially with this, like, pizzicato texture. And, oh dear god. Now it's just fast. <laughs> Without warning, for some reason. It just reuses material. Other than the violin thing that's happening, which I think needs some, some slurs or something. I don't know. It's a cool, like, harmonic progression. But there's no, yeah, there's no development of it. We're gonna get another... <laughs> the same four chords. Okay, now we're back to the first thing. I'm pretty... Pretty sure, let's take a look. I wish it would let us look at this. Yeah, it's the same thing. Also, what in the hell? We've got harmonics 
in the violins, which I am almost certain I did not know about artificial harmonics at this point, but I'm also certain that I knew that like this wasn't I have no idea what what is going on with this harmonic circle. Yeah, there's no way for them to do a, a natural harmonic, but I also am certain that I did not know about artificial harmonics. So I have, I have absolutely no idea what's going on there. This all goes back to the first idea, which is incredibly premature. It's like the same, it's the same music and there's a double bar line. Is there a change to a, I need to zoom out. Yeah, yeah, then it's the F minor material, but now it's in C minor. And then it does the fast thing again, but now it's in C minor. And then it ends fast on those like four chords. Okay, yeah, this this movement is markedly worse <laughs> than uh, than the first, I think. I don't know, I think there are some good ideas in it. Like, I don't think that the first melody that gets introduced is bad. And I can also tell that there's like some thought given to who is playing and how. Like, there's a much more intentional orchestration, I think, than the first movement, especially with this like very sparse like texture and the, the bassoon solo and such. And it does have like a very cold feeling to it. Like, it does ha have... I think the desired effect, but none of the ideas are developed just like in the first movement. It's like something happens and then something else happens and then the other thing happens again, but now it's like in a different instrument or a different key or something and that's like the only change. And yeah, I mean, I think one of the most challenging things for me to learn was how to take a single idea and spin different kinds of music out of it that was like continually refreshing the idea if that makes sense i mean i don't know i don't know if anyone watching this has also been watching my videos on my actual symphony number one where i'm talking about how i how i wrote that and such and detailing the actual composition but that was a huge part of that piece for me and that was even in my first two years of college where it was like i have to figure out how to take this eight bar theme that i really really like and continually figure out how to turn it, have it turn into multiple minutes of music without it getting stale. And yeah, that, I mean, again, that was like a really, really big thing even up to even up to then. I'm doing a quick glance ahead at the other movements, and I think more or less my comments are going to be generally the same. I mean, there's some there's some good ideas in the fourth movement. I didn't visually see anything in the third movement that I thought was going to be good. <laughs> the fourth movement looks like it has a good rhythmic energy to it, but I mean, I can tell just visually it's again just like repeating the same stuff over and over, and so I don't want to make a video of me just saying the same stuff. <laughs> So hopefully those uh, first two movements are sufficient. I'm really sorry if you were really looking forward to <laughs> hearing the rest of it, but um, maybe maybe uh, another time. But all these all these movements are in C minor. The third movement starts in C minor and deviates to C major, and then but then it goes back. But it's it's just filled with one four five one stuff. Also, I'm noticing there's like a really late tempo change and then a, a ritardando before the end of this piece in a rhythmically driving movement. So I'm not, <laughs> I have to listen to this at least. That That's what I'll do. I'll listen to the end of this symphony. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the, the eighth note thing. I wish I could scroll down and look at it. We'll, we'll see it in a sec, yeah, in the full orchestra. Blasting trumpets again. <laughs> oh my lord! <laughs> the pacing of that is evil. That is so awkward. So yeah, the big problems obviously orchestration, instrumentation. I had no concept of how symphony orchestras actually functioned. I also just thought there's no percussion in this. I think I was just terrified of it. I had no idea how to balance instruments, what the different like registral characteristics of instruments were and what idiomatic writing looked like. The dynamics again are just <laughs> all over the place in this. If they happen to be present at all, all of the musical ideas, as I said, are, are underdeveloped. I don't even have to listen to the third or, or fourth movements to, to know that that's the case with those two because I, I just looking at it is enough to, to remind me. Uh, I do, however, think that there were some good ideas. There were a handful of melodic things that I think worked really well, really effectively. But I think the biggest strength was the rhythmic language. Um, it felt like the rhythm, I mean, even into the second movement, the rhythm felt like the one thing that was like consistently fitting 
it consistently fit the the vibe of the music and oftentimes the rhythm really was the uh predominant feature anyway that's a lot of thoughts i hope you enjoyed looking at this with me it is super illuminating to look at my old music and try and get into a past version of my head to sort of work out what exactly is going on and what exactly is missing. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit the like button and consider subscribing if you haven't already. I would really, really appreciate that. I'm going to keep making videos like this, so stay tuned for those. And yeah, thank you so much. I'll see you next time.